Gwini Ushla. Wherever you are in the world, welcome to this very special celebration of Sam Bennett, one of the leading sportsmen of Ireland and the world, being honoured here in Clonmel tonight amongst his own in a very special virtual hybrid ceremony on the occasion of his incredible 2020. Sam, welcome home. Thanks for having me. How are you? Not too bad. What have you been up to since? Um, unfortunately, I've had an injury the, uh, this season, which uh, made me miss the Tour de France. But at the minute, uh, yeah, everything is going good, and I'm uh, targeting uh, next season. So we're going to celebrate you here tonight. Have you any idea of the joy and the celebration and the pride there was at your 2020 back home? Um, unfortunately, I think I missed a lot of it, but I think I got to see some of it on social media and get a little feel for what it was like. Um, I think it was something that I should have come home to experience after the race, but unfortunately I had to focus on the, the Volta Espana afterwards. But um, yeah, it was, it was really nice to see the, the joy and the excitement at home while the, the Tour de France was going on. Wonderful to meet you and wonderful to have you and your family here tonight. And I hope you have a great evening. And I hope we show some of the appreciation that we have for you and your great achievements. We'd now like to hand over to the Cahir Luck of Corle Kunde Tiberdorn, Marie Murphy, to formally open proceedings as the first citizen of County Tipperary. Marie, over to you. Thank you, Paul. Good evening, Sam, Tara, Helen, Michael, Gay, and Shane. Um, it's an honour for me um, as Cahir Luck of Tipperary County Council to preside over this uh, civic reception for you here tonight. I'd also like to welcome our Chief Executive, Joe McGrath, staff from Corporate Services, who've put an awful lot of work into making sure everything runs smoothly tonight, and of course the Master of Ceremonies for the evening, Paul Collins. A civic reception is the highest accolade that Tipperary County Council can offer, can give to a group or individual um, to recognise, honour and pay tribute to their achievements and you've had some outstanding achievements in 2020. We're a little bit late in awarding this um, civic reception but the pandemic put paid to having it any sooner. Um, as I said, the civic reception is in recognition of Sam's outstanding cycling achievements um, during the 2020 Tour de France, where Sam won two stages and the, the overall green jersey as the most consistent, highest finisher, sealing victory in the final stage down the Champs-Élysées on September 20th, 2020. You have brought major honour to your hometown of carrick on and to County Tipperary with your triumphs in cycling. And on behalf of the citizens of Tipperary, I thank you. Sam, enjoy the evening. Back to you, Paul. Marie, thank you very much for that. Um, Sam, the first citizen of, of Tipperary, extending um, their, the pride of the county in your direction. Um, we're dying to talk to you about cycling and, and the demands of it and the ups and downs and the great year that you had. And tonight, we've spoken to members of your family. Um, don't worry, I don't think they'll embarrass you too much. Um, some friends that shared the journey with you, because we all kind of feel that we, you know, when you, when you have someone who achieves great things as you have, and we know them uh, from being down the road or whatever, we all feel a bit of, of, of taking a bit of pride in that as well, of course. But you were born in Belgium uh, before your mum uh, and, and dad, um, Michael and Helen, moved back to Ireland. I mean, do you have memories of Belgium or, you know, where you, do you still kind of recall that time? Small mem a little bit of me sorry, a few memories, but uh, a lot of them actually are riding my bike at the back garden, so uh, some good memories, um, but uh, not many of them, I suppose. Yeah, because you came out, you back to Ireland when you were four-ish. Mm. Yeah, back um, back when I was four, and uh, yeah, back to Carrick and Shore, um, kind of, yeah, back where my my cycling career really took off I suppose. Yeah well we've lots of people to share the journey with us and give us some insights into what made you great and of course a lot of hard work went into your spectacular 2020 which we look forward to hearing about but first let's go back to the start the very start. 31 years ago this uh, month 
he um, appeared early and uh, from that day I knew he was a sprinter. He had great balance. He actually walked very early at about eight and a half months. And um, from there he, you know, he had a love of wheels. And I used to always have him on the uh, back of my bicycle, carrying him around Wervik in Belgium on cobblestones to and from school. They start quite early over there, two and a half. And we got him for his first Christmas uh, tricycle, a little wooden tricycle. And his little legs used to fly around sturdy out on that. And then he progressed onto a little bicycle with uh, stabilizers, which our friends, kiddies, children wanted to remove. And he was only shortly a year, a year and a half. And I thought, well, how far can he fall out in the garden? And Michael went out and went to hold the saddle and told him to, to, to cycle. But he never held the saddle. And off he went. And from there on in, <laughs> he was cycling. He just loved cycling. No stabilizers. About a year and a half, a year and 18, eight, 18 months. And people used to stop around Wervik just to see him flying around on the little bicycle. <laughs> you know, with no stabilizers. So yeah, yeah, he had a love for bikes from a very, very early age. My earliest memories, I suppose, of Sam would have been that I had a uh, cruciate ligament injury with my knee and uh, I was on the bike trying to recover and Sam was insisting every day that he wants to go. So um, just problem with us and there was the bicycle lanes there. So it seemed to work very, very well. And every day he had to come out with me uh, cycling probably a lot further than he should have been for his age. But like from a, just a very, very early age, it was always, always the bicycle for him. I do remember having my basket on the bike and Sam's little carrier on the back. And I did all my shopping uh, with Sam on the bike, you know, going around on the bike. We almost, uh, you know, it was uh, just a fun thing we did, yeah. We came home when Sam was about five years of age and he was always talking about the bike and wanted to do cycling and uh, at that time, you know, cycling had gone down a lot in Ireland and there was actually no kids cycling in Carrick. So I can remember my mother lives in uh, Coolnamuck Road and we were up for Sunday dinner and uh, there was a race in Carrick that weekend and all the cyclists were warming up and all the kids were warming up and everything. And Sam turned around and jumped and pointed and he said, that's what I want to do. So I suppose from, I always remember that, like, you know, so um, we had a mobile down in Clan A and that, and we met some folks there and uh, they had a kid, there was one kid there who cycled with Kentork and Cork. So we brought Cork, our Sam down there to uh, start racing in, in Kentork. I got to know Sam, you know, down in uh, Clan A Strand. Uh, he had a mobile home down there, his, his parents had, and I was down there also. And uh, he used to be going around uh, the mobile park there and, uh, yeah, speeding around. And uh, the uh, the caretaker, the owner, they used to be giving out about the way they were riding around. Um, and uh, then I started hear about him, of course, in the races. They were talking about him. This guy, you know, Bennett, he has got a lot of talent. He's going to be a, a great bike rider. Uh, but I'd held that before, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, riders up and coming at the junior age, Waterford, Dungarvan, Carrie, Clonmel, um, and you know, other towns a bit further away. And, you know, they were talking how much talent they had, but they got so far and they never made it. But, uh, yeah, Sam was, uh, he had the potential, but, yeah, there was always the question, would he be able to continue to develop? Because in junior, uh, some guys, you know, can be so dominant, but when they move up to the next level, under 23, distance is longer, the races are probably a bit harder, you know, would he be able to continue? And yeah, Sam did that. Um, it was a bit of a slow process, but uh, yeah, he got there. And, you know, we all know now what his uh, performance last year, Tour of France and Green Jersey, um, and all the other races that he won. And uh, he's uh, proved that he's, yeah, one of the, yeah, the top, if not the top sprinter, one of the top sprinters in the world of uh, professional cycling at the moment. First time I met Sam, um, he was nine years old, and myself and Bobby Power, Lord mercy on Bobby, we ran a mountain bike league in the hills behind us here every Sunday morning in October, in October, November, December every year for about 10 years. So Bobby had was approached by Sam's dad 
to know if he could go in it because it was open from 10 up to 16. So Sam was only nine. So a bit of pull and persuasion, we, we got him in anyway. So the first time I met him was um, wet Sunday up in the hills in the mud and he seemed to enjoy it. And as he went on, he you could see he was getting better and better and faster and faster. And I think it was the second year we were doing it, third year we were doing it, and it just kept improving and improving. So I remember one Sunday, myself and Bobby standing there, we just looked at one another and said, look, we have one. We have the next Kelly here. You know, we knew we had a guy who had the qualities to go on and do it. The first time I met Sam Bennett was up in the wood. I had heard a lot about this young lad who was a, an absolute flyer. So I went in around the corners to see the daredevil skids that he used to be doing around. You know, it's scaring the bejesus out of the other lads. Uh, it was just a great, exciting thing to see, watch on a, on a Sunday morning. When Sam was young, we had four young kids as well. So we had a seven-seater car, so we used to take Sam to the races because he was young. He was only 16, like, when we started bringing him. And he was riding junior races, and then he got permission then from Cycling Ireland to ride senior races. So I was going to the races, so we, we, we used to use it as a day out, like. So we took Sam, and we after the races, then we'd feed the ducks, and we do the family thing with the flask of tea and sandwiches, what you'd done back in them days. You know, now it is 52 seater buses and, you know, but it was different in our day, like, you know, we had fun in the car and he was only like a kid, like, you know, when you're looking back on him and he's still, when he raced, you know, he won the big races and he was always good and fast, you know, so Sam was just, you know, just a normal kid, like, going to the races with us and the family and the family car. Sam had been racing uh, as a youth cyclist and had been doing fairly okay, but not winning a lot of races. So Sam and his dad came to see me and asked me to coach him. Uh, he told me he could do a lot of things fairly well at cycling, but the one thing he wasn't able to do was sprint. Uh, so that was our first port, port of call. And obviously he was totally wrong on that. I always remember the first time we actually did a sprint session and the two of us went head to head and I just hammered him, which was great. <laughs> that was the last time because once he learned, you know, how to get his gearing right, where to start his sprint and just a little bit of explosive training. He's never looked back since. Sam, if you were to move from Belgium, which is a very safe and cycling friendly country to anywhere in the world or in Ireland, Carrick and Shore was probably not a bad place to start if you had an ambition to be a cyclist. Yeah, absolutely. Like, there's just a huge cycling culture in Carrick. Um, Carrick and Clamel actually. Um, and yeah, you could like even turn up on a on a Sunday spin like during the Christmas. There could be eighty riders there, but you know there's a lot of guys there from, you know, the Sean Kelly's time and like there hasn't been so many guys kind of coming through since. But when you're there, all those guys have the world of knowledge and can really bring you through. So, so yeah, when once you're you're there and you you're willing to listen and learn and yeah, they can they can really bring you on and they they know how to ride a bike. What about the terrain? I mean, we've heard the boys there mention about Seskin Hill and, you know, the roadways and, and the hills around uh, Carrick and Shore. I mean, even today, is that of use to you? Yeah, um, like I don't get home often, um, but sometimes I might try to pl plan a trip to maybe three weeks here where I just do a lot of base training. But, you know, they're, they're, they're hard roads, they're heavy on the legs um, and the terrain, it's for my capacities, it's, it's the perfect training grounds. Um, I get my best legs here and maybe there isn't a coincidence that me and Sean were successful from here because, you know, I, I, yeah, I get my best legs here compared to anywhere else in Europe. I'm told from a cycling insider that the cross winds around Carrick and Shore and the South East um, have been beneficial to you in later in your career in learning to cope with them. Is that the case? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think, yeah, I, I enjoy the crosswinds a lot where other guys wouldn't. Um, but I think that's also, you know, with the, the cycling knowledge in Carrick, learning how to ride a bunch, um, to, to read the wind, it always helped from a young age. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's something I, I quite enjoy now, yeah. What about the Sean Kelly connection? I mean, you know, any of us who are Irish when we go abroad, if there was someone anyway famous from our neck of the woods, I'm sure you'd be asked you know, about Sean Kelly, do you know Sean Kelly? People saying that, you know, prior to, to yourself, Sean Kelly was, you know, a man who excelled in the Tour de France in 1989, which was the year before you were born. I mean, um, and then you later ended up working with him. Yeah, 
yeah but it's kind of funny I kind of maybe I'm wearing out this joke but I always kind of made a joke that when I was younger Sean Kelly was a sports center I didn't really know why, who he was and I'd say he, Kelly loves that I know yeah I don't know I don't know what he loved it but um it wasn't really until I went out you know himself and Kurt Bogart they um yeah they took me as an injured rider into their team and developed me to when I turned pro and uh it wasn't until I went out abroad and raced the races he was in and I was struggling to finish them and he won so many of them and at the highest level that I really understood what he had achieved and how great he was and you know I have a huge respect for Sean and, and what he did and even to see him to walk down any street in Belgium people literally stop and point at him and oh Sean Kelly mm. you know so it's um it's it's, it's great to see and uh, something I admire and I mean you know do you have that bond then that you can say listen Sean I'm having a trouble with uphills or down dales or whatever the case may be or you know endurance or whatever is that a conversation you can have I think so um I think you know like we, we'd have a good understanding for each other and uh He's often the guy that would be there, mainly behind the scenes. Um, but yeah, somebody you can you can always turn to for advice. And you know, we heard your dad and your mum talking about how you really embraced cycling, probably before uh, or in tandem with walking at the time. And when do you feel that you began your cycling journey, or the the flame of cycling was lit within you? Because, like when we're going to school, we all think we're going to play in the Premier League, or we're going to win the Six Nations, or we're going to win something so when did that kind of idea begin trickling around with you i have no idea really like it was just it was a it was a build-up like i was always on a bike i was building ramps and jumping off things and i just remember from a young age saying to other kids that i want to be the fastest i didn't understand that you, there's different disciplines within the sport on the road like i didn't know you had to be a sprinter or a time trialist or a domestique uh, I just wanted to be fast um, but uh, yeah I think it was something that when I saw it it just always got my interest I remember one summer it was we were at the, in our mobile home in Plan A and um, my dad showed me the Tour de France on TV and it really grabbed my attention then um, couldn't believe that somebody raced for three weeks and I don't know how people could do it <laughs> um, but uh, yeah it's just something that I always loved and it just went yeah just just grew when we were talking earlier, you know, I was saying to you about, you know, uh, 3,482 kilometres. Like, a lot of us, you know, can't really comprehend that distance or even, you know, 100 kilometres in, in, in cycling days for or uh, cycling distances for regular people. But looking at your career, starting off in junior and progressing through, is it like kind of the steps of a stairs that your body and your mind and your career is is starting off in junior maybe get a few wins in the Ross and then maybe a win in the Tour of Britain and suddenly you're thinking I could kick on here yeah absolutely like it's something that it's an endurance sport and it takes years to progress to build that endurance um I definitely think there's results throughout my career that give me like a a sign of potential like for sure like the, the the junior tour of Ireland the Kerry Youth Tour that was even before that um, European track championships the Ross they're all s- stepping stones that kind of showed me that there's potential there um, and also gave me the confidence to, to go on to the next phase or the next step in, in my career um, but yeah it is something that takes time to build up and even for myself like uh, I didn't really break through until I was 27 as a, as a pure sprinter and often the pure sprinters break through at 23, 24 so it takes time but um yeah, you have to. You really have to stick at it. In having a cup of tea earlier, you were telling me that there was an awful time where it looked like you might have to actually go to college mm. and not be a cyclist. Yeah, um, yeah. So I had a few years where it was, yeah, some mishaps. Like when I was, uh, I can't remember. I actually hit my head at the time, so I can't remember how old I was. I think I was eighteen or nineteen. I was hit head on by a car. That's when wow. Sean, uh, Sean Kelly and Kurt Bogart took me took me in. Um, uh, helped get me back on track, uh, get me injury free, and it took three years to get get there. You know, like. And are you questioning everything at that stage? Oh, absolutely. Um, because I'd always try to rush back. I do too much. I'd either get sick or injured again. And mm. um, was, yeah, it just kind of came to a stage when I was about twenty three. I was uh, after getting two knee operations. Wow. And uh, we said, yeah, look, at the end of this year, if I haven't made it, I I, I go to college or I I get a job or whatever, but. 
we have to call it a day with cycling so i put everything into it and uh, it was uh, a tour of britain then when i was going there actually kurt bogart told me if you win a stage here you get a pro contract and um i put everything into it talk about motivation i know yeah so i i just got it and uh here i am today and what was the option in college um i already started um oh man i can't even remember now um uh, exercise and health studies oh well uh, so you would have kind of been looking at that whole sports yes. space yeah yeah it was always like sport was always something i was interested in and i think i i started that with the idea that maybe i can learn something that i can use for my cycling career you know um learn something about the body that could give me a gain so yeah it'd be something that i would have kind of stepped back into i, I probably would have always stayed involved with sport some way and you're based in monaco now um, that's probably handy for getting to events, is it? Yeah, absolutely. Like, and also, you know, I wanted to be there because you're in with the best cyclists in, in the world, and um, you know, you get into that mentality, and it, it just raises your game. Um, and again, yeah, you're 20 minutes from the airport, you're real central, uh, good weather, so it's a fantastic place to be to be based from, and to yeah, to yeah, it was the next step in my career as well to put myself in that environment. Well, there's another. Monster Man, based in Monaco. He's from Cork, and his name is Eddie Dunbar from Bantir. Me and Sam did come up through the Irish system racing from a young age, you know. We actually had the same club as the youth, Kentork Cycling Club as well, and um, that's something we, we do share, and it's just something to be able to relate to, to that. We, we, we've both kind of come from the same place. Um, we've gone through the same system to get where we are, and um, I think... Yeah, that's 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 something um, we understand about each other. Um, so that is a definitely a mutual respect. But as I said, it's it's easy for people to look and see on paper results and um, to see what they see on TV. But there's so much more that goes into into them performances and um, a lot a lot more hours um, than than you'd expect. I think. Um, so I think, as I said, anyone who's close to Sam knows how much work he puts in and the dedication he puts in like the effort the time like everything is is taught out thoroughly with sam and um he um he has his way of doing things and uh it's just it's so good to see it work for him you know one thing that i've learned sam tonight is that major endurance events of the type you've been involved in you you shared the view that you know it takes years to prepare for these that you can't you know get the body ready uh, in a short term that it'll take a couple of years to do that but what about you know is it a 52 week a year gig is it can you take any time off do you can you you know have a plate of trifle or an apple tart or what way let's get to the important stuff by the way <laughs> um but i mean you know overall how does it influence your lifestyle in your year i mean I think from a very young age, I put everything towards cycling. So I didn't have that many nights out on the town with the with the with my mates and that. Like it was always kebab on the way home. That's it. Um, it was always cycling. But I think as I got older, I learned that okay, you have to be switched on for eighty percent of the year. But you have to learn to switch off as well, and you have to you have to you know step back and let the body rest and the head to recover. Uh, it goes hand in hand, you know, the the mental side and the physical side. So, so there is times where you know, like I break up the season into three parts. Um, I have my time off uh, right after the season for two or three weeks. I aim then until I, yeah, go into the season in good form, break it up, then have another week off in around March, April. Um, is there any cycling in that? I try not to. Um, often. I yeah. could do that. Yeah, <laughs> you know, but um, yeah, it's just about, for me, I'm able to work, I'm able to do the hours, but the head has to be there. So mm-hmm. I have to learn to, to really break it up and to also breaking it up, I do it in the Tour de France to make it easier and to, to be able to approach it. Would it be fair to say, Sam, that apart from progressing in your career, that you've progressed in knowing Sam and knowing your body and knowing what you're capable of and developing your mental strength. I mean, one other kind of aspect that came through chatting to your, your dad and your mom is the impact of going to Marseille as a teenager had on you, where, you know, you're, you're really looking to develop independence at quite a young age. Yeah, I mean, um, I moved abroad basically from when I was 18. 
um and i think you know at that age at home in ireland it's it's nice being at home is it's get easy. the washing done uh, it's 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 easy uh, and then you go out and all of a sudden you're alone like you you really are alone and you have to, to really learn to look after yourself mm. um so there's that side of it like just the, the lifestyle um and then also i suppose the mental side and the mental toughness is even just from doing your first grand tour to be able to deal with that many hours on the bike and the days and the enjoyment. is there meditation kind of stuff or what is it it's just as i said a few minutes ago it's more breaking it down and making it more simple mm. um because if i look at three weeks altogether it's too hard yeah i break it up into maybe four different races or stages or stage races within the race but um but yeah it's all it's all a mental game and is there gym work or is it all on the bike there's gym work yeah there's gym work stretching i don't think when you're on like when you switch on for the season it doesn't really doesn't really stop it's a it's a it's a full time it's 24 7 mm. it's like it's getting your sleeping pattern right it's getting the right amount of sleep like you're wearing, wearing gadgets that monitor your sleep and give you all the readings so like you really have no time away from it like and a lot of the time you're just chasing numbers you know so um it's yeah it's pretty intense but but uh if you don't do it somebody else will mm. and did you have a sense that 2020 was going to be a great year, if not a good year? Before it started, I did. But once it started, I didn't. <laughs> you know? um, it was something that didn't get off to a great start. Um, there's two races in the season where the best sprinters are in the world are judged, and one of them is UAE, maybe Paranese. And uh, I didn't perform there. And um, the pandemic was something that, uh, for the sporting sense, give me a second chance of a season you know like to to reset and to come forward don't get me wrong the pandemic was an awful thing but i don't think my success at the tour de france would have happened without it why it was it was a combination of a few things but um i don't think i was in the condition i needed to the training might have been slightly off for for myself and um just needed to things aligned for you yeah things yeah things really aligned for me mm. and uh, i was able to step back reevaluate and go again and uh yeah the, it's it's yeah it wouldn't wouldn't have happened without it well it's one of the purposes we're of, of why we're here tonight um to remind you of the great memories that you gave the people of carrick tipperary and ireland including local representatives sam Bennett, a local hero here in clonmel as well as his hometown carrick and sure sam has uh, done himself proud over the last number of years um, after winning eight stage stage wins in, in various uh, cycling events throughout uh, Europe and, and two stage wins in the Tour de France in 2020 and holding on to the green jersey. So we're all we're all very proud of Sam. His mother Helen, she's from town here in Clonmel, a few hundred yards away from where we're, we're standing at the moment. His uh, granddad Paddy Cashin still lives there um, and his, brand, his granddad is a great character here in town, uh, a lovely gentleman. Uh, and has great pride. We were also proud to see um, Paddy on, on television there, uh, just after Sam won his first um, stage in the Tour de France. The joy that was was in that man's face spoke for us all, I suppose, here in Clonmel. Sam, the heights that you reached in the season of 2020 are notable. Notable because of your achievements in the biggest cycle race in the world, the Tour de France. The winning of two stages that you did, the winning of the green jersey, your final day, the Champs-Élysées, when a Carrick man crossed that line in first place is probably your greatest achievement to date. Sam, I'm so looking forward to following you and your career going forward. I wish you the very best. You're a great man, you're a great ambassador for your sport, for your family and for Carrick and Shore, and I hope you have a fantastic night. Sam, I want to offer you congratulations to you and your family for their amazing career so far in cycling and what's still to come. It's a great honour for you to receive this civic reception. It's the highest honour that any, t any council in Ireland can bestow on, on a person to congratulate them on their success. On my behalf and on behalf of my party, I want to congratulate you and uh, I would like to, to propose that you, there's a new park we're, we're hoping to have in Carrie Peg and I'll be proposing that you, the park will be named in your honour. We have Sean Kelly Square and now we should have Sam Bennett Park. 
No, bit of breaking news for you there um, tonight, Sam, so congratulations on that. Um, and you'd be delighted to hear that your exploits are encouraging a new generation of cyclists, Sam, from all over the county, and in particular the north of the county. I think he's a wonderful sports ambassador. Just reading up in his story, I wouldn't know Sam very well, but, you know, just he's taken, you know, not to give up on what you, what you dream of and your dreams. And if you have something in mind to go for it, you know, Sam did say that he tried all sports and eventually he found the one that he loved and it was cycling and look where he got to. Anybody would tell you that cycling is one of the toughest sports out there, you know, when you see them in Tour de France and where they go and where they cycle, like it does take some stamina and and power and courage and the whole lot in the one, do you know what I'm saying? But even, I was reading up in his story, his granddad was a big GA, a hurling man, and then his dad I think was a footballer, so look, there's lots of sports involved in his family. Cycling is an individual sport, you know, we all take for granted, you know, when you're involved in a team, it's probably a little bit easier. But when you're actually out there on your own as an individual, it's, you know, it's all the more harder. But you have to admire people that take it on and take it to the world stage and achieve on the world stage. We don't see achievements like this too often in our country, especially when it comes to sports like cycling. But look, he set the world stage alight and we, we should be so proud of him here in Ireland. I wholeheartedly support the civic reception for Sam Bennett and I think, you know, he deserves you know, the, as much recognition as possible by the county because certainly we as a county are very proud of him. And I can see even his success and his achievements, you know, have had an effect on our own cycling clubs here in Ballina, which is the Killaloo Ballina Baru Tri Club and the Killaloo Cycling Club. And Sam's success and prominence really encourages, you know, members to become, encourages people to become members of cycling clubs. Even a lot of people in cycling clubs now, you know, are senior citizens and it's great camaraderie, you know, and great to get out on their bike and, you know, it's, it's just marvellous for them. Sam, you know, huge congratulations again, you know, and thank you for all the wonderful memories that you have given us, you know, and, and, long, and long may your success continue. From my early childhood days, I've gone down to my mother's hometown, uh, Carrick and Shure. She lived and came from a place called Cora Duff, Crahana. There was always cyclists there and Carrick Wheeler cyclists and referring to the likes of Bobby Power and Sean Kelly and those legends. Sam Bennett is another one who's just following on and Sam made a comment about his father when he was training that he never went over 10 miles in training up to the age of 16. I think there's a lot to be learned for that across all sports, where there's burnout in players in GA and soccer and all that. He trained lightly up to 16 years of age, but by God did he come strong in later years. And maybe it's because the light training is his youthful years that stand him to him now. I know he picked up a few injuries there recently, but it's a very disciplined sport. It's one of the toughest sports that anyone can take on. And to be training on your own and doing the hard miles on your own, the diets, all the testing, the drug testing, all that has come with it. It's a seriously difficult and hard sport to be in. And to be able to do that on your own and come up to the Champs-Élysées in the last day of the Tour and win, he's only the fifth man ever to win a Sean's uh, last stage with a green jersey and it's great to see it and it was a huge boost to everybody. Sam, it is a singular sport, it is a solo sport but it's a team sport also so how do you plan that for the Tour de France because you know ultimately while you're cycling you know solo you're working to a plan and tactics I presume. Is individual uh, definitely when it comes to you know your diet training getting yourself ready um yeah and also like being fit and you know being able to race in yeah, and ride a bunch everything really kind of up to a certain point but then yeah a lot of the time you do need a team and it is massively a team sport we mightn't train together often um but yeah especially for a sprinter like I, I need guys around me um you know yeah like okay I do the hard work at home myself but when I'm on the road I have guys that control the race from kilometer zero I have guys like that have different jobs um that's relevant to their capacities um and I've yeah, you know the last two or three guys in front of me are guys I, I can really trust and I can almost just you know, we're, we're so in tune with each other. I can read their body language, what they're going to do next. Um, because it's such a high speed and there's so little margin for error that, um, yeah, you know, it's I rely on guys massively. And what does the tactics board look like for the Tour de France? I mean, like, so obviously it's taken as red that you're fit. It's taken as red that you're, you're ready. Um, but in the lead up then, what are you doing? Are you sort of looking at the routes and looking at attack points or what are you doing? 
So before each stage in the morning, we have um, a big screen on the, at, the, at the front of the team bus um, and they'll have uh, videos of the last five kilometers. So, you know, every pothole on the road, even um, often it's always changed because the Tour de France completely take out roundabouts to make sure that it's, it's safe for the, the sprints. Um, so you'd have like a preview of the, the run in. You'd have the the weather. Is this right your team's team. information, this or is, is this generally provided? Um, no, this is something the team has to get. Every team does it, but it doesn't mean that it's always done well. Mm. You know, so mm. so there's a lot of information we get beforehand, um, and yeah, you're, everybody's told their job throughout the day, mm. um, and it's also kind of planned out so that you're you're still able to do your job later in the race or have your own chances later in the race and and is the information regarding the strategy on the race given as late as that as the morning of the race normally it is yeah like well, sometimes on a big race where you wouldn't have much time in the morning it'd be the day before but you're you're trying to really not think about it until the day comes um you don't want to, to be wasting energy on it um and then also you're also we also have the the team radio so we're communicating in the race and we've been fed information throughout the, uh, throughout the day. Well, we're glad to be able to share some of the views of your team uh, from the great events of 2020. And let's reflect on that with some of Sam's team members. Fighting for green with uh, with Sam the last three weeks has been uh, has been a lot of fun. It's uh, it's given us a, a goal every single day. I'm sure also uh, that uh, that quite a few of the the breakaway specialists in the in the peloton has been uh, quite annoyed with the battle. But uh, for us, it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun. Well, it's been a long journey because from the first day on. Sam immediately was on the points. Some days we lost points. The intensity and the length and time and days it took to to take it made it, uh, made it into a very nice battle. As further we got into the race, as more and more it became a possibility for Sam to get into the green, and as more also important got all the intermediate sprints. So. Yeah, uh, me and Sam and the rest of the team have been involved in basically all intermediate sprint during the race, which of course uh, took a lot of energy, but uh, it had it ended out with a very nice result. Yeah, but did I really win this? Yeah! 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 <laughs> Tim! Yeah! yeah, it was a, a crazy experience actually, by controlling breakaways or also to keep the guys in the front and also in the mountain stages. I always stayed uh, with Sam. I was happy I could contribute uh, a little bit to that, uh, to that nice thing we, uh, we achieved. A green jersey in Paris is um, it's something rather special. It's been a while that the team had it. I think the last time was with Tom Boonen, I think 2007 or something. It's something um, really special. I mean, we had a lot of good sprinters, a lot of stage victories in the last years. The green jersey is the the best sprinter of the tour. It's it just means something special to 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 every team. The first uh, objective of the team was to to win with uh, with Sam because uh, it was his first victory finally. So in uh, in Ile de Ré, so it was super nice to to see him win like this. I'm really happy uh, how he. We manage and how we manage it for for bringing uh, the jersey to Paris for sure. I just want to thank everyone that's been involved. I just want to thank uh, the whole team. It's uh, it's amazing for Sam, you know. It, uh, I think uh, during the three weeks race of the race he, he really uh, became uh, more confident and, and stronger also so yeah I think he did a really good, good great job he, he fight a lot and uh, I think wow, he, he can really be proud of him he made 
all my dreams come true in this in this grand tour and uh, I couldn't have done this without you guys. Thank you very much. We're proud of you, Sam. <laughs>How do you feel after that, Sam? Yeah, it's like, it's nice to look back on it. You know, it's actually been quite a long time since it happened and uh, you feel all the emotions again, which is, is quite nice. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was a roller coaster. They talk about emotional roller coasters, yeah, but I mean, yeah, yeah. mother of God. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's just like, it wasn't just getting to the end of the stage. It was like getting to the end of so many years of hard work. So... Yeah, it was yeah, it was quite up and down with the emotions, but um, yeah, it was it was an amazing journey and great group of guys to to, to go through it, go through it with. Um, how was the body all through that? I mean, did did you feel that you had the capacity? Like, you know, we we charge our mobile phones at night when it's on ten percent or five percent. Did you feel that you had it in the body to? No, absolutely not. No, like I went into the race looking for one stage one, and uh, I was chasing that. And the later it goes, the race goes on, the more the pressure builds. And I nearly went halfway through the race without a stage win, and the, the chances were running out. Um, so I got like, I was, you know, like I was close on points. I thought, you know, it'd be cool for me and Julian Alaphilippe, who's in yellow, to be in the jersey at the same time. So if I can wear it for one day, I'd be happy. Um, I ended up wearing it for a few days. I was <laughs> quite liked it and uh, got my stage win. And one thing led to another, but. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was something that, yeah, it was, as the race went down, the pressure built and something that I wasn't really used to was, you know, like, it really blew up at home and it was like the pressure of expectation wasn't something I was used to. It was a new type of pressure. And how did that break through? I mean, in you know, in theory, you're in the zone and you're blotting it out. And I mean, how do you, how does that pressure kind of feed through to you in France? couldn't sleep <laughs> you know yeah. um you know i'd see it on social media and like no matter how much i try to turn the phone off you still kind of feel it mm. like the tour de france is big the occasion is big but even the last week of the tour de france i sleep in three to five hours a night i was i was like yeah it was just pure adrenaline mm. you know? well, well. Um, and obviously your mum and your dad you'd be in touch with them and um, your mates would probably be telling you what the setup is around Carrick or back home, would they? Yeah, like uh, especially afterwards when I saw like they were sending me videos of the parade and stuff, and mm. you know to see their reaction watching the last stage, uh, it was it was it was really nice to see it. Yeah. And despite all that, and despite the fact that you were aware that you created an impact as a result of the pandemic, then ironically you weren't able to meet people. Yeah, I know, and as. It was sad because, you know, like looking back, I should have enjoyed the moments. I should have come home and felt the atmosphere and felt the excitement and be there for that, that parade at home mm. and mm. to see how the, the, the hometown was decorated. Um, but I was I was maybe too focused on the next race. And yeah, it was it was very difficult to get home. But um, yeah, it would have been would have been nice. To, yeah. Well, we can give you some insight right now as to how some of the locals celebrated Sam's big week. So it was a kind of funny tour. It took people a while to realise the tour is going ahead and Sam Bennett's in it and Sam Bennett's probably going to win the green jersey. I have to be highly caffeinated for all of this. I just feel, you know, oh my God, you know, I'm nervous till the end. And every single day, every time Sam races, every single race, I will always send him a text message and that morning and he'd give you the thumbs up and you're always happy when you get the thumbs up because you know okay things are good here <laughs> you know it's in, it sounds good that was his main aim at the stage of the tour de france you know to get his name on that list and he done that Ewan is ready to go past him. It's Bennett and Ewan in a drag race on the line. We had booked, we had flights for the Tour de France that obviously everybody in the country has vouchers for still <laughs> that year. Um, we were due to travel. Then people were saying, would you not go? Would you not? And we could, you know, the pandemic in all due respect. And we said, right, we're going to. And then we were limited to the people, the friends and family we could have at home to watch it. We watched it over in Michael and Helen's house. Your heart was in your mouth and, you know, you had 
Michael beside you, would you think he'll win now? Hitting you, hitting you, hitting you. Would you think he'll win now? Would you think he'll win the stage? Put your house on him, you know. So it was all building, building. And Michael is not, uh, you know, the most calmest people. Like he's, you know, kind of a hyper. So <laughs> my heart was up in my mouth and I couldn't jump around. But I was trying to watch it. But I couldn't tell him, you know, stay quiet because it's his house. And, you know, I'd rather just stay quiet and watch it. But Michael is, you know, up the walls. Naturally enough, his son going to win the biggest stage, you know, stage of the, the biggest stage race of the world. One kilometre of racing to go. Bennett is in a perfect position. That day gave a bit of joy for a lot of people. Bennett goes on the left hand side. Bennett now going. The green jersey of Sam Bennett is looking for the stage. Bennett, the green jersey, wins on the Sean Saliza. I'm trying not to cry now, I'll be honest with <laughs> A real proud day, you know, the way, even though he's not my child, but it'd be, you know, any woman, any mother would be proud, like, to say a, a young fella or a son won a thing like that, like, it was a real proud, proud day. It was lovely. You know, winning a green jersey and winning stages in the Tour de France is what it's all about for a sprinter. And I, for me, there's no higher, higher accolade he can have in pro cycling, so I'm comfortable Probably more comfortable in myself now with regards to his career because I, I feel that he'll be more comfortable and happy within himself for, since he's achieved that. So the big question, Sam, is your dad right? No, I'm always looking for more. <laughs> I'm greedy. <laughs> no, it's funny, like, you know, like he, I came out and I should have enjoyed a moment, but I was already looking at the next race and I, I don't know why that is and maybe it's something I need to, I need to relax a bit, but... Um, Maybe something that kind of got me here today, so I don't really know how to look at it. Of course, yeah. I mean, we, we spoke about this earlier and outside about the mentality you need for this. Um, I mean, like, you're getting three hours sleep a night, you're cycling thousands of miles, um, but yet you need to be switched on going down to Champs-Élysées. I mean, and your dad was saying that one of his proudest aspects was, was your strategy on the running. I mean, talk to us about that. Yeah, it was something that, like, I never, like, it was one of my three dream races to win at that stage. Um, and But I didn't think about actually winning it until the last intermediate sprint on that day, just because I was so focused on the, the green jersey. Like, I was willing to throw everything away just to maintain that because I thought there mightn't be that opportunity again. So we didn't actually plan it too much and um, we had like a rough idea but in sprints often things change and you just have to learn to adapt but it was more yeah when I was in the zone and I was confident and I had I had no pressure because I've achieved everything I thought I could that day um I was able to I always say it's cringy but like I was in a, in the zone and it was like things just slowed down and I I could see in my peripheral vision who it was behind me who was on my side at either side I know how to judge my sprint off their capabilities. I know them very well, like my competitors, and uh, I was able to read the situation. I knew the wind direction, the gradient of the road, the, oh. the right line to take. So I had all the information I needed from the laps before, and uh, I even let go. I let my lead out man's wheel go, let two guys slot in, and I yeah, I took a run at, uh, at a, another train that uh, came in between us. So um, yeah, there was a lot of, kind of calculations going on in the like and that was those that idea and that kind of switch happened within 50 meters but we passed that 50 meters i think within oh, i don't know five seconds or wow. less like you know wow. like but so it's it was um yeah everything just kind of came together in the day what about the jewels of endurance competitors slovakia's peter saga and all these kind of guys out there to like everyone's out there really to, to try and do what you're doing yeah um and it was like what made it special for me was that peter sagan was the guy nobody could beat for uh seven times before well there was one time he was disqualified so he was out of the race but anytime he was in the race he won it seven times yeah in a row for him um so to be able to yeah dethrone him <laughs> i would say um it was uh yeah it was good for my confidence um, and the Champs Elysees is the one that all the sprinters want to win. It's like the the, the world champs for the sprinters. Um, so uh, yeah, it was yeah one of my best moments in my career. And now it's just like, how do I get that high again? Like yeah. I don't know if I'll ever be able to achieve something like that again. 
I mean, we saw, we saw the shots there, like coming down the Champs Elysees, cycling past the Louvre. You know, uh, if it was me, I'd be saying, God, I must go in there and look at the, uh, the Mona Lisa at some point. Yeah. But from your point of view, can you take in anything you're watching or, or going around? I mean, just the shots of France and, you know, it, it's a real advertisement for France, which was yeah. probably one of the purposes of it initially. But it's, it's a great visual event, isn't it? Absolutely, on TV it is, but I can just tell you how the road was. Okay, <laughs> I can tell you it is bumpy, um, and that it is actually. You just like, saw tarmac. You didn't see the Louvre. But that's it. Like I didn't like. Okay, no, I will lie. The first lap, we 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 come on to the Champs Elysees. You hear the crowds, and there wasn't many that year. And you hear the crowds, and it's really like it's like you know, it's just a great atmosphere. And then you're you're coming up to the um, yeah to the, the, the to the roundabout at the top. And uh, the jets fly overhead, mm. and they have the French colours, and it's just the atmosphere. It's like something. It's like nothing else. Um, it's like you're entering a stadium. <laughs> and what's it like, Sam? Like we saw, we, we saw you there. Like, and you say that you do it not in real time in your own head. That mm. you kind of slow things down, but you're crossing the finish line mm. in Paris. Like, what does that feel like? I was like, even five meters before, I was like. Okay, where is the guy that's going to beat me today coming from? <laughs> that's your Irish kind of coming out there. I know, um, but yeah, you like you could see like I was shaking my head, like I just couldn't believe it, like wh- while it was happening, and like I even lift the bike over my head. I know the bike isn't heavy, but I, I don't have big arms, you know. <laughs> like I lift it over my head, I was just like on another level. Like I was, it was yeah, I'll never get that same buzz again. So what do you do after winning a race like that? Um. Have a burger? Had a whiskey. A good oh, Irish whiskey. Good man. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we just come back. Like So we have the, the ceremony. Um, like we, we go on the podium. That takes a while. I, I got to meet my wife at the finish. Um, good Carrick woman. That's it. <laughs> um, Shout out to Tara. <laughs> um, and then after the, the presentation, um, yeah, we get uh, go back to the team bus and enjoy the moment with the team. And um, Normally... They'd have a hotel or a, a restaurant booked out for the whole team and we'd go and party the night away, but mm. it was just a few drinks at the bus and then everybody went their way, which is a little sad really, yeah. but considering the circumstance, uh, I'll take it, absolutely. Just incredible. <laughs> well, it's it's even now, like it's still vivid for all of us and I'm sure it, it will be for you for, for many, many years. So it's just great to, great to share that time with you. Um, now, we are also being joined here by the leading... Chief Executive of the Tipperary County Council, uh, Joe McGrath. Joe, what's your personal best over a 100-yard sprint? <laughs> Nothing like it. I'm captivated by, by what we're hearing this evening. Um, I hope the people looking in are as captivated as we are in hearing Sam's story. It's just a wonderful, wonderful story. It's electric. And, and to get inside the mind and giving us some detail there, so... I think this evening is very much about, Sam, I think it's first and foremost about the elected members, the, the elected citizens of Tipperary saying thanks to you and recognising your achievements and uh, all 40 coming together and saying, yeah, this is this is somebody who deserves to be uh, recognised in a civic reception. And sometimes I suppose as a people, as a county, as a country, we're guilty of thanking people too late or not when they're at the top of their career. Or not at all. Or not at all, indeed, or, or, or acknowledging that. So it's wonderful that we're able to do that here this evening at a time, I suppose, when, you know, you've captured the green jersey, you've achieved so much, you're you're still a very young man and there's so much ahead of you as well. Um, and it's uh, it's just wonderful to be here uh, in your presence and in the presence of your family. It's lovely that you could be here as well, all of you, uh, to see and to witness uh, this very, very special occasion, I suppose. Um, we'd like to think that... Um, Civic receptions are as rare as yellow jerseys, and, and they are certainly rare, as rare as green jerseys anyway as well, Sam. So um, I hope you enjoy this evening, and I hope you take away from you this very, very large, wonderful appreciation here and right across this county of what you have achieved, and indeed right across this country of what you have achieved as an individual, as a sportsman, and the extent to which this country, this country and this county is is grateful to you for what you've done. And particularly, I might just say again, and we've made, made this point before about in 2020, when it, you know, it hasn't been a great year. So we were, looking to, we were looking to be lifted along the way, every opportunity we could look at to be lifted. And you've given us that opportunity. Thank you so much indeed for that, Sam. Thank you. It's good to have you here. And the importance of sporting ambassadors generally 
Joe, for all of us in terms of, you know, encouraging physical activity and, you know, giving us a lift, I suppose, from your point of view, in, in running the county must be hugely important. Very important because, I mean, all of us, you know, we can all remember back to our young days when we looked up to certain people, sports people that we looked to. And it's no coincidence, I think, that the three virtual receptions held by Tipperary County Council have all had a sporting theme. We started out, of course, with the Tipperary footballers who made history going in, 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 in again, in an important year for us in winning the Munster final and going on beyond that. Uh, we had uh, Rachel Blackmore here last June, again, extraordinary achievements in the in the racing area uh, and acknowledge her and of course we've got Sam here this evening as well so it's very very important when we look at Tipperary and we look at sports people and we look at young people and we look at people that they might look up to I'm sure you must be conscious Sam of, of the number of sporting cycling clubs around this county I see them on the roads you see them as well I'm sure and I suppose in, in, in their mind every one of them is a Sam Bennett in their mind and the children that are out there, they're a Sam Bennett as well. So the young boys and the young girls that are out there, they look up to you and they look up to so many other people in different sports around this county. It's important to have those ambassadors. It's important to have those heroes uh, for people and to give them a, a sense of purpose and a sense of participation as well in whatever sport they choose to undertake. And to bury cycling heritage and the protection and expansion of that, Joe, is something that's high on your agenda? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's important. We 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 we, we may never get to the, the height the heights that uh, that Sam has scaled, but certainly, I suppose we are very very conscious in terms of what we can do in terms of getting cycling and walking, what we call active travel. That's how you participate on a day to day basis. So if we can get people out of cars and onto the whether it's walking on footpaths or into cycle lanes. So for this year, for example, we'll we'll spend just under five million on active travel, um, f- footpaths, cycle lanes. You know, we've spoken before about the Shore Blue Way. We've spoken about other... I love that Blue Way from yeah. Care down to exactly. Carrick. I don't know if you've cycled. It's probably a bit low grade for you now, yeah. um, Sam. It's all level. So for the likes of me now, it's ideal. No, I've been on many times. Yeah, it's beautiful, lovely. Yeah. Beautiful, yeah. yeah. Sam will cover that in five minutes, of course. Well, I know that. <laughs> in a few days. I had to stop off on Ollie Maher's on the way down as well. We'll, but have, that's to, another we'll, story. To, we'll have to extend it, Sam, even further into Watford to make it worth a while. But, uh, but they are important to have these. But as I say, we, we, are, we are very, very much engaged in getting out these, uh, these smaller pieces of infrastructure around the county to say to people, well, look, we'd like people to maybe take the opportunity to engage in active travel. And, um, and also, I suppose, there are good health reasons. And... And for the environment, and exactly, you're not using the th- car to go down and get a well, thinking of what bag of potatoes of what's happening today in Glasgow and in other parts of the world, and saying, well, cycling, you know, what could be more environmentally friendly than the sport you 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 so much proudly participate in, Sam, and indeed so many others. So, um, we are we have those we have all those uh, rolling those out. As I say, we're spending just under five million, and hopefully in the years to come, we'll be able to even draw down even more funding that's drawn down from the National Transportation Authority from the Department of Transport and we're, we're very keen and ambitious to go and even get more funding into the county for those kind of initiatives. Great to see, great to see and Sam I'm sure we heard from your mum earlier you know in Belgium cycling around it's, and going to the shops with the bike and sort of in leisure or just using it for commuting it's it's a really big thing on the continent. Yeah absolutely like you see definitely in Belgium, Netherlands it's a way of life um, and it's huge. Yeah, you see like people of all ages using them and I think it's fantastic. Um, even like, I know we don't have a great climate, but a lot of the time now there's Belgium um, and they seem to really make it work and uh, it's, it seems to be a great way of getting around. And um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, you can save a lot of time as well. Uh, like in cities where there's a lot of traffic, mm. um, it's, it's used quite a bit. Um, and it's a lifelong pursuit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's... it's um, it's something that you know it's accessible to to people all ages mm-hmm. um and it's what do you say sam to the young girl or young boy watching you right now saying wow i'd love to achieve something like that i think um you know i have a saying that i always follow and it's like everything you want is outside your comfort zone and it can be adapted to suit everything in life it's like if you want that job if you want that degree you have to work hard you have to go outside your comfort zone to get it so yeah my saying is always you know everything you want is outside your comfort zone but yeah if it's cycling in particular just go out and enjoy the bike any way you want and uh it'll 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 come to you well 
I, we, ha we have a couple of video messages to wind up before we hand over to the Cahirlik ones again, Sam, including one from a fella who reckons he sold you a half-decent bike. Hi, Sam. It's great to see you getting such an honour tonight um, with Tipperary County Council, you know, that they're acknowledging the, the fantastic achievements that, that you're after doing. And um, I think it's always good, you know, it's one thing to, to be recognised abroad, you know, and the likes of France and everything like that, but to be recognised locally, I think that's that's such a, a huge honour and, and it's so important as well because, you know, you're giving a lot of inspiration to an awful lot of local people as well. And, and it's great for you and for your family because, you know, it, it, it highlights, uh, you know, how much how much enjoyment you've given people locally and uh, the, the impact that, that it's made. So I hope you, you have a really good night. Enjoy the night um, yourself and, and everyone there with you. And uh, really looking forward to, to seeing you back on the road again next year and it's even, even more success on top of what you've done already. Okay, enjoy the night, Sam. Local man, Barry Meehan, did he sell you a half decent bike, Sam? He sold me my first road racer, my first road bike. So, uh, and, and actually it was uh, a bike that I, uh, I sold when I was going through the ranks and the last few years I, I tracked it down and bought it back. So I have it at uh, wow. my parents' home. How much would you be looking at for a bike like that and how much would you be looking at for the type of bike you're cycling and winning massive races on right now the bike i'm on right now you'd be looking at it around 15 16 thousand euro wow. now i don't own actually i don't think i own any bikes but that's what they they cost to, to well, buy yeah. the wow. team um we get sponsored bikes and i'd have about five or six of them per year but they get swapped over and like how much do they weigh like what are they made from is it carbon yeah it's all it's carbon fiber and titanium um we've a, a legal minimum weight of 6.9 kilo so normally we try and get it as close as close to that as possible well well yeah interesting well we have another man who is no stranger to these parts who has a little bit of a message for you um you, you we have spoken about him earlier on and we can now reveal that this man is not just a leisure center sam i'd like to say congratulations uh, on your um achievement um from the Tipperary County Council, uh, very well deserved, of course, you know, after your performances last year, uh, this year, um, you know, um, very much deserved. So congratulations once again, um, congratulations to the Bennett family, um, because very important part uh, of Sam's career, uh, his wife Tara, of course, and all the people involved in cycling uh, in his earlier days when he was coming up in Carrick and Shore, um, you know, all had an important part uh, in getting to where he's got, where he's at this moment. Uh, so congratulations again. But we're looking forward to next year. We want you back there winning these big sprints um, uh, in, in the big races and Tour of France, of course. We want to see you winning stages in the Tour of France and uh, challenge for the green jersey once again. So Sam, no pressure. Enjoy your off season, but we want to see you in the winning ways again next year. So no pressure, Sam, but he's kind of still learning a bit of pressure on you all the same, but probably no more than you're putting on yourself. That's it. Uh, he's always able to put pressure on me. <laughs> but uh, No, no, he's, uh, he, he's right. I, it's it's a, a place I want to be. It's a place I, I worked all my career for, and I want to get back to that level. So, yeah. What's the intermediate, medium-term objectives now for you? Um... Like from here to Tour de France? Or well, like, oh. well, we've got Christmas coming. Um, yeah, so the stuff going on in your world. Yeah, so I, I have uh, my my son will be coming into the world in the next within the next month, hopefully. Um, or actually, not hopefully. Uh, one month we want him want him well cooked. Um, and but also yeah, targeting next season and to be ready for February. What's the like? Is it as simple as win everything that's in front of you? Um, I think yeah. Well. I won't say it like that, but I think when you're trying to be one of the top sprinters in the world, you have to be able to win all season long. And teams don't want a sprinter that can't win. So, so yeah, so yeah, maybe yeah, try and win everything. I've just a <laughs> tiny little bit of a sour note, Sam, here tonight because we're delighted to have you, your mum and your dad, and everything else. But the Bennett family is not only about Sam. There's another Bennett, mm. Scott. Yeah. And uh, I met him there a few weeks ago, and we're about to find out something that Scott has had to endure over the last while. So I hope you have news for Scott here tonight, a little surprise after this word from your dad. I always think of all the homes in Ireland and all the different sports where you have young talents like that and the way the household 
kind of ticks around them and operates around them and it can be unfair to other members of the family and everything. Scott, every summer and holiday is like cycling. Yeah, holidays. every, every holiday think. we've had, like we were just talking <laughs> about, every holiday yeah. we've gone on yeah, since cycling. Sam was 12 years yeah. of age has been like for cycling, you yeah. know what I mean? So, and again, even within our own family, you know, we got a lot of financial support yeah, from did. members of our family as well, which we've always appreciated. and. They were very, that type of support was hugely important and, and gave Sam the leg up on equipment and travel and everything else that he needed at that stage so he could step on if he was getting bogged down and he was under pressure, you know. We got so much support within our family financially and everything else, so much support from people around the town and it's fantastic like the way, you know, what Sam has done the joy that everybody can take from that and the fact that people can say, you know what, and like I would often turn around to people and say, well, you know, you're part of that journey. Yeah. You know, so it's fantastic yeah. to be able to say that to people and mean it. So two things there, Sam. In Ireland, they say that it takes a village to, to raise a child. And certainly tonight we've learned that a lot of people have been with you on the journey so far. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, everybody involved in my hometown, my home county, uh, yeah, country of Ireland, like they, they've always backed me and there's been so many people uh, uh, that supported me and everybody had an involvement in, of me getting to the Tour de France. Um, and yeah, without without that support and without that help, I, I wouldn't be in the position I am today. Um, it took it took the help from <laughs> full town at least. Um, <coughs> sorry, and more. Mm, yeah, it's great. Just lovely words from your dad, and uh, you have a lovely big present for Scott for this Christmas as well, haven't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. I am. Um, it's still in planning. <laughs> well, listen. Just before we wind up, Sam, uh, it's been lovely chatting to you here, t and hopefully you've enjoyed it at home as well. But before we go, uh, Cahirlock Marie Murphy will make a formal presentation to Sam Bennett. Sam, this is. Um the civic reception scroll and it was uh, passed at um, the plenary meeting on the 11th of October unanimously that you, we would give you a civic reception in recognition of all your outstanding achievements in cycling and this scroll will hopefully um, hang proudly on your wall. I'm not going to read the inscription because it's all been said already tonight um but it's just all recipients of civic receptions get a scroll outlining what it's for and the date and it's signed by me as Cahirlock and the chief executive joe mcgraw also thank you very much most welcome there's still, and there's more don't there's, there's more, more sam there's more <laughs> there's more um i don't think there's one for everyone in the audience in this case marie this is a painting that was done by Mike Gale. He is originally from Lithuania. Um, he's been living in, in Ireland and particularly Tipperary for many years. Um, he recent, himself and his wife Valentino recently bought a property in Clahine. So that's why we've got, um, uh, he hopes to open uh, uh, an art studio there. Now this He's been engaged in painting Irish motifs for a long, long time. But the, the thing about this, he doesn't use oils and acrylics. Um, this painting was done using Guinness. Okay. Um, he uses either Guinness or coffee. And I have to say, when I saw his paintings um, six weeks or so ago, I was fascinated by it and I just said was there any chance yeah, that he could do I explained what was coming up here tonight and uh, he said yeah he's got exhibitions lined up I've seen um, the what Trinity College Christ Church fabulous paintings all done in Guinness I believe he's going to be having an exhibition in the library in Carrick and Shore coming up in the new year and one in Clamella also. So it's unique, nobody, uh, and we've, we've had it framed with glass over it just in case. It's absolutely <laughs> beautiful, thank you very much. So Sam, that's it. Um, I, hopefully you got a sense of uh, the pride that you, you've, you've created amongst your neighbours and, and those that have shouted you on from afar. Yeah, no, it's been a, a, a beautiful evening and I, I just wanted to thank you all for, for honouring me tonight. and. Uh, very much appreciated and I, I hope I, I can do you, you proud again in the future. 
Well, thank you for, for being here. Thanks to you at home for joining us. Sloan.